All things rate of return. Have you ever wondered what's a reasonable rate of return? What should you expect from your rate of return? How do you calculate your rate of return? We're going to cover all that and more on today's show. It's Brian Preston, the money guy. I'm excited. And what a fantastic lead. And I got that you're juiced about talking about rates of return. I am. And why wouldn't you be juiced about it? Because it's a big deal. And it has huge impacts on the financial viability of your entire plan, right? It's a pretty significant thing. We do have four big points we're going on this because I was kind of excited. We, we this, this show has morphed in so many different directions since we started writing the show notes a few weeks ago. We've now, we first started off thinking about all the facets, all right. the different things that influence your rate of return, but that, that didn't seem motivating. I wanted, I wanted this show to be somewhat motivating. Sure. You brought that up. You said, we need to bring some energy into this yep. so it just doesn't turn into an analytical discussion, and I completely agree. So I've got something I'm going to be bringing up shortly to kind of get into that, and then we will close out the show and tell you how to even calculate, because a lot of you guys are probably doing it wrong if you're doing basic mathematics of figuring out your average rate of return. So we'll, we'll share that with you. Make sure you go check us out on moneyguy.com. By the way, anybody who's out there in the live stream, we are 20 subscribers from reaching 20,000. I think that's kind of poetic. I didn't even realize it was yeah, 20 to get to 20,000. 20 for 20. So it. we'll see if we can do it during this show. And um, for you that are watching this at a later time, I need you to subscribe and also click the, the ding dong clock or the bell so that you get the notifications. Yep. Um, so, so tune in and, and we want to get you connected with all the stuff we're constantly creating for the Money Guy Show. So the first thing I want to cover is understanding the power of rate of return. Bo, this one hit me because when we were at lunch today, you said we got to get 88 times over in there. We have to. I mean, we can't talk about rate of return without mentioning this unbelievable concept of 88 times over. We love compounding interest because, you know, the, the reason we use the talk about the concept of 88 times over is if you take a 20-year-old, one of the things that got me even into this as a profession was I had the high school teacher that told me if I could save $100 a month, I could be a millionaire by the time I retired. And that kind of woke up something that was sleeping inside of me. Because you, re you recognized how attainable it was. Because yeah. I don't come from money, you don't come from money. And just hearing that $100 a month could make me wealthy, I was like, I could do that. Yeah. So it made it much more attainable. So that put us on the mission of this 88 times over. And where that number comes from is that if a 20-year-old invests in something as simple as the S&P 500, a dollar invested in the S&P 500 making approximately 10% mm -hmm. per year, all the way up until they reach 65, that day that they reach 65, that $1 turns into $88. It's unbelievable. That is magical. So here's what I want to talk about is what if you, I think the biggest risk that a young person has is what if you're a person who's 25 years old and you fund your Roth IRA, you yep. can put $6,000 in there in 2019. Right. What if we could apply that same logic to 88 times over of what could it turn into? What's its potential? But the thing I worry about for 25-year-olds is what if you don't understand rate of return and you don't, you're not swinging for the fences at such a young age? Mm -hmm. I mean, when you have 30, 40 years from retirement, you should be aggressive, yep. no doubt. But there's a lot of people, because you don't have knowledge, because you don't have the skill to know what you're investing in, I think oftentimes there are um, younger people that actually don't take risks. That's right. they, they, they pull it down because they just don't understand. And or maybe saving, they had a, a model from their parents that they didn't know about investing or know how to go out there and take risks. Maybe their thought of investing is CDs or something like that. So may, hopefully this will be your wake-up call on the power of rate of return is think about a 25-year-old that can make 10% a year for 40 years because you got 40 years until you reach 65. Right. That's 480 months. It could potentially turn into $322,000. So I want to say that a little bit differently. If you're someone out there who's 25 years old and you're listening, every Roth IRA contribution that you make right now, if you max out your Roth, could be over $300,000 when you're 65. If you invest in something like the S&P 500. Um, but think about this. What if you were that scared investor at 25, didn't know any better, and you went something much more conservative? And instead of making 10%, you made 6% on your investment. Because remember, the whole purpose of the show today is to talk about the power of your rate of return and how it's all impacted. Right. So if you invested and it was only 6%, so you trimmed 4% off of your rate of return, do you know what that money would be worth with the same amount of time invested, 40 years? Well, okay, so let's see. 322000 is if you made 10%. 
and 6% is a little more than half of 10%. So you figure half of 322. 60%. So if you yeah. did 60%, no. 160, 170 thousand no, yeah, dollars. Well, if you do 322 times 60%, you can quickly see that should be well over 180, getting close to 190 thousand right. dollars. No, your rate of return at 6% would be 65,745 dollars. 65,000. So it dropped from 300, no change in behavior, no change in activity, no change in what they're yeah. doing. The only thing we altered was the rate of return that it was achieved. The, the difference of $256,000 is all driven by rate of return. So this is why we want to talk about the power of your rate of return is get it right, know where you are in your age group so you can take the chances. Now I want to flip the script on you because a lot of people out there, you just heard me say, well, I need to be swinging for the fences. I need to be taking more risk. Right. Let's fast forward and look at a 50-year-old, 60-year-old, you know, somebody who's five to seven Someone years from retirement. Someone who's closer to retirement. So somebody who's five to seven years from retirement, what happens with their rate of return if they're doing it wrong? Because I want you, when you're 30 or 25, why would you want to have the portfolio of somebody who's retiring five to seven years yeah. when you've got 30 to 40 years right. to retire? When you're 50 to 60 years old, why would you want the portfolio of a 25-year-old when you only have five to seven years to retire? You see how they're the exact same sentences. I just flipped the script based upon how much time you have, and that impacts the rate of return. So hopefully by the time you're in your 50s to 60s, we're at seven figures. So mm -hmm. I took an example of somebody who had a million dollars. If you had a million dollars, and I think I, in my show notes, I said 50 originally. It's actually a 60-year-old. 60 a 60-year-old with a market loss of 12%. Okay. So think about it, because markets do go down from yeah, time yeah, to time. Yeah. And you've got to think about these things when you're investing, and because that's rate of return. Yeah. We don't always make money when we're trying to grow right. assets. So a million dollars invested, you lose 12%, you still have $880,000. You lost... 120,000. So you can right. make that back pretty sure. quickly, probably. What if you were a 60 year old that didn't understand your rate of return and what was needed? So you invested in the S&P 500. Okay. We know how good it is. The S&P 500 makes around 10% yeah, per year annualized. Return, annualized. Let's go for it. You know, that's what we're thinking. But at 60, the S&P 500, if you took a year like 2008, lost 37%. 37% loss is a loss of $370,000 on a million dollars. So now your million dollars is only worth $630,000. Exactly. So the difference between those two numbers, the 880, if you did it, if you, because look, you notice I didn't say you weren't losing money. Right. Anybody who is invested in a diversified portfolio, when you have a year like 2008, where the market gets its teeth kicked in, even if you have a somewhat conservative portfolio, you still could lose some money. But it was much more, it was mitigated substantially. Instead of losing 37% like the broad market did, you could potentially lose like 12 to 15%. Sure. So the difference between these two is $250,000. Only difference was, was rate of return and the structure of the portfolio. So I think what you're saying is rate of return matters both on the positive side as well as on the negative side, and it matters both in the accumulation stage as well as the decumulation stage. And we're going to dive into that a little more as we go That's through exactly. This. You need to understand the power of your rate of return. So that leads me to the second subsection that I want to talk about is what is a reasonable rate of return? By the way, when you type in rate of return on Google or anything, this is actually the question that usually comes up. I mean, I feel like how many times, just when it, whether it's a money guy audience or people in the community or potential clients, how many times do you get someone to ask you, hey, if I invest with you guys or if what, what you guys do this for a living, what's a reasonable rate of return? What should I be making? So I think more if when you put up the highlight clips, I bet the one that does really well is the one you'll probably do one is what's a reasonable rate of return. Yeah. This one will probably get some views just off the title alone. Mm -hmm. So I wanted, to, I wanted to set the table, though. When you start trying to figure out what's a reasonable rate of return, I came out of college in the mid-90s. And I've told Bo many times that the period of time that you enter the workforce and start managing money greatly influences how you manage money. Yeah. And, and, and just so you all know, Bo came out in the, the second half of the 2000s oh, yeah. So what do you think? He's greatly influenced by that period. I just mentioned 2008 where the market lost 37%. Right. Guess who was managing money in the beginning of their career that time was yep. Bo. So as you can imagine, Bo has some pessimism uh -huh. built into his outlook on That's things. Right. 
Me, who came out in the mid 90s, I'm rock and roll thinking things are always gonna be great. And let me show you why. I have something I wanna put up on the screen. Do y'all see these rates of returns back that, in the, in the in, I mean, from back in 1999? Does that say 134%? Yeah, those are the top performers in categories from 1999. But then look down at the bottom. Here's the one that will blow your mind is the categories by age, by decade. Holy cow. So, that, so like especially technology uh, for that decade, so from 1990 to 1999, annualized 28.7%. By the way, you can find large cap on there. You can. It doesn't have to be some crazy specialty category. There's I mean, broad large categories. Large blend, too. that's just S&P 500. That's at a 15.65%. Do you realize for what a decade. happens for if you can make 15.5% for 10 years running? So is that a reasonable expectation? This is why I'm asking this because you have to, what is a reasonable expectation of a rate of return for your portfolio? So I'm going to put this to bed now for a little bit. We'll come back to this. Don't worry. But here's the thing that I think is interesting because I just showed you 1999. That could cloud your judgment into thinking, and this is why we ask this. We'll go ahead and let you see behind the curtain of what it's like to work at a bound wealth or become a client of a bound wealth. We ask a question of what do you think a reasonable rate of return mm -hmm. is? We want to know this. When you're a prospect, we want to know what's going to make you happy. If somebody comes in and they tell me, I expect to make 12% a year, we know we need to have some conversations because right. they're pro they're still back in that time machine of 1999 that's right. where that's where rate of return. So that's that's having an overly optimistic yeah. outlook. Let's now look at the other side of it. Well, I, I, I was going to say a lot of times, Brian, when I'm talking to uh, potential prospects who are thinking about retirement mm -hmm. or folks who've maybe been on the sidelines for a while, and we ask that question, they may say something like. Three, four, five percent. Yep. They think that's a reasonable rate. That tells us less about their tolerance for risk and a lot more about their prior investment experience. Yep. They remember the dot com busting. They remember the Great Recession. It's really interesting. The reason we ask that question is so that we can get that insight into what they think. And, and I think that that adds a lot of value. I mean, whether a person is too aggressive or too conservative, let's just have a good conversation right. with them. I want to, because here's something that's been in the news recently. Now, I don't have a screenshot for this one. <clears throat> but Vanguard's Greg Davis just, you know, he's he's the the, the head of their investments. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I want to tell you, if you didn't know, Greg said this. It got a lot of press in February, but Greg actually said this back in 2018, too. Okay. I don't know why it all of a sudden got amplified when it came back out in February and he said it in an interview. Right. But he said he expects at Vanguard, they expect the annualized performance for the, the financial markets could be around 5% a for year. For the U.S. equity markets, For right? the U.S. equity markets could be 5% a year for the next decade. And that's down from what they had previously projected at about 8%. Mm -hmm. So you hear that and you're like, oh man, this party. They're not, they're not the looking. Now, I want to tell you, just to give you some background on Greg. Greg's a bond guy. Okay. He comes from a bond background. Bond guys... They can be a little down on equities. <laughs> they don't exactly love, you know, it's just like I pick on you for coming out in 2008. Yeah, yeah, you have yeah. a pessimism. When somebody comes to me from a bond background, I'm like, oh, okay. It's a little bit so different. You're probably not loving the S&P 500 and things like that. So I'm going I'm to use that to, to, to talk about expectations. But then here's another thing when people ask me about Greg, Greg's prediction. Because predictions, I will tell you, be very careful. Yep. I think you can get in a lot of trouble. But I do want to talk about some analytics. If we're only going to make 5% a year for the next decade... I want you to think about the fact that your cash now makes 2%, mm -hmm. easily 2%. I mean, a lot of our money market funds at you know, Fidelity and so yeah. forth, 2.4, aren't right. they getting close yeah, to 2.5? Two yeah, 2.5% two, two almost. So we're supposed to believe the difference between risk assets and risk-free assets is only 2%? For you financial nerds out there, that's called the equity risk premium. And historically, two to three percent is pretty low for an equity risk premium. The other, the other counterpoint I would make for Greg is that um, inflation, inf wage inflation, you're starting to see it tick above three right. percent. Well, that that is a huge indicator on long term inflation because wages do impact how people spend and so right. forth. I just I don't know that I buy into the five percent. Mm -hmm. If I if you, if I had to give you another play besides Greg being a, a historically a, a fixed income guy, I think he's also doing the tried and true practice of downplaying expectations yeah, yeah, yeah. because nobody gets mad or fires you 
for telling that you're going to make 5%. And then when you make 8%, everybody's happy. Nobody fires you for that. Now, if you tell everybody you're going to make them 12% and you come in at nine, they cuss you. That's right. But if you tell them five and then you make eight or nine, and then they're going to be like, Oh, he's a hero. They See, they put you up and they dump Gatorade on you. A little bit of a setting expectation. I think it's yeah, controlling I don't, expectations. I don't disagree with so that. So I think he's, you know, he's he's kind of, he's out there in left field with a limp. And then when the ball's hit to him, he's going to run and catch it. So the whole point we're talking about is, okay, well, what is a reasonable rate of return? We just heard, we saw some unrealistic expectations. We talked about vanguards, maybe conservative, trying to set expectations low. How does one go about determining what is a reasonable rate of return? Or how do we calculate a reasonable rate of return? Well, I wanted to put another thing up on the screen. Morph, give me two seconds to get it on there. So I looked, I went and I said, well, what's a good average stock market return? Okay. So if you went to Nerd Wallet, they had a piece that just came out. I mean, this is like just a few weeks ago, March 7th, basically last week. Uh, March 7th, they came out with this piece of what is the average stock, stock market return? Kind of sounds the, like what we're talking about right yeah, here. Yeah. So from 1926 to 2014, yeah, I mean, it was, it, this was, it was, was talking about is 10%. It said the S&P 500 is around 10%. And most people look at it for to have bands between 8 to 12%. But the problem, and this is something we talked about in an oh, Ask yeah. the Money Guy segment, segment we just did yep. earlier today, is that there's only, and since in that 1926 to 2014 period, that's a long period of time, mm-hmm. there's only been six times that it actually lands in that 8 to 12%. So, so I want to say that again. You said the average stock market return was 10%. It normally falls somewhere in the 8 to 12% band. But in all of those years, almost 100 years, 90, you know, 88 years, I think, if I did my math right on that, it only fell into that band on six different occasions. From so volatility is definitely something you need to understand and appreciate and expect when you invest in the equity markets. And I think didn't I think it was this article that said uh, average market returns aren't always average. Exactly. That's right. So that's something just to, to keep yourself straight on understanding that averages just don't happen that much. That's right. And then I you know we couldn't close this segment out without talking about. The, the, the Dow bar behavioral oh, yeah, impact, because behavior, we yeah. know that behavior is going to come into play because I could tell you the S&P 500 makes about 10% a year, uh, but does that mean that's what the average investor gets? No, because not, what not happens, if we did, I should have done the market cycle of emotions because you know what happens is the typical investor, when things are looking great, where markets are hitting all-time highs, that's when people are loading it up. Mm-hmm. They're getting all into it because they don't want to miss out. That whole FOMO thing that's kicks true. in. When markets are getting their teeth kicked in, and we all should be running in to get into this thing as much as we can. Everybody's, everybody's trying the to exit. get the heck out of that's it. Right. And, and you see cash spike during those periods. So be, you have to take into account behavior. So let me just give you some stats. This is now, this is only a 20 year period. So okay. that's why you'll notice the SP is a little different on their 20 year period versus going back and looking at what um, NerdWallet did sure. from 1926. Um, their average equity fund investor makes about 5.29%. Now, this is as of the 2018 Dalbar quantitative analysis of investor behavior. Okay. Um, the average fixed income investor. Right at 0.44%. Right at half a percent. The average asset allocation fund, that's what I would think is probably like a 60-40 or target yeah. retirement, 2.58%. Wow. None of these are anywhere near where we've talked. Oh, yeah. And then inflation was at 215 over this 20-year period. And then the S&P 500 was 7.2%. So it's really interesting. The, the average equity fund investor, who you would imagine probably is pegging themselves to the S&P, some pretty significant underperformance relative to just buying the index. So what is a reasonable rate of return? I will tell you, I think the answer is it varies by what your actual need is. That's right. And that's what I want to get into now is talking about what is the type of return that you need, not something you just randomly pulled out of the air because you saw what the S&P 500 did, or you saw that list from 1999 where you had... 10-year averages that were over 15, over 20%. I want you to understand what is a reasonable rate of return and how it is so custom and should be built upon what your needs are. So you're saying a reasonable rate of return for any individual investor is very much specialized to that 
individual investor. So we have to figure out what influences your rate of return. Let's transition and kind of talk about those things because your heads are probably spinning a little bit. I've thrown a lot of numbers out there. So I want to now bring this back to you as an individual so you can have a better understanding of rate of return Perfect. and what how to design a portfolio that kind of captures what's required for you to meet and have the life that you want that checks the box on all the goals, yep. that actually has enough money for you when you want to actually be financially independent. And then also helps you know, should I be taking more risk or should I take my foot off the accelerator of risk and bring it down? Yep. All these things need to take into account where you are in your financial life. So the first thing is Return and rate of return is a two-faceted metric. That's exactly Bo, right. Bo, you're our investor specialist. What, what, is it, what do I mean by that? Yeah, so return is generally comprised of two different pieces. There's generally income return, there's capital appreciation return. Here's a really easy way to think about it. If you buy something that's worth $10, one way you can make money is if when you sell that at some later date, it's worth $12, you have $2 of capital appreciation. That's one component of return. Well, another component of return is sometimes we can invest in things that pay cash back to us like dividends or like coupon payments for a bond where I may invest $10 and I may get a dividend of $1 back to me, paid directly to me. That's an income component. So there are two different pieces, yield and appreciation. Do, is it good to focus on, I had to make sure we I know, weren't I at 20, looking back because I'm I hear it over there ticking. It. You guys are doing good on getting to 20. But here's the thing. Should you focus on just yield? Because there's, I, and let me put this in some context, Bo. There are whole strategies out there for people who are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, where when they get to that retirement age, they start thinking, should I focus only on the income That's or right. the yield, or should I let it be more all-consuming of focusing on all areas of the return? Yeah, we think that what makes the most sense when you're looking at designing a portfolio or thinking about how you capture return, total return is what makes the most sense. It should have various components of income, but also various components of capital appreciation. I can tell you, uh, you know, we did the Money Guy Misses a few weeks ago where we talked about these big investing mistakes mm -hmm. that we made. One of the things that I did very early on when I bought my very first stock or when I bought my very first bu bucket of stocks is I went and looked through Yahoo Finance and I picked a stock that had the highest yield on it, yep. like a 13% dividend yield. Because in my mind, I told myself, oh, well, that's a guaranteed 13% rate of return. How is that ever going to go bad? Well, a 13% yield doesn't do you a whole lot of good if the stock price drops by 20%. You've lost money. Here's what Bo and I were talking about this in pre-show planning is that we were talking about how typically whether you're talking about bonds on fixed income or dividends with stocks, the higher the, the income or the yield, probably the more risk you're taking. That's right. I'll give you the example on fixed income. Think about it. A junk bond or high yield fund, junk is kind of... It's, called, it's high yield is the fancy way, but it's really junk bonds. Sure, sure. It means that they're, they're riskier investments on the bond side is going to yield substantially higher than uh, you know, a classic Coca-Cola or, or some other treasury. company, a treasury or something. You know, if you're talking about a government security, it's because you're paying, they, they have to pay you more for the additional risk, risk. you're taking on. Right. Same thing with dividends. Does a company... Um, think about, it. does the dividend of a Procter & Gamble or a bank have to be the same for a high flyer like, like Tesla company, or yeah. something like that? It, the difference is there's more risk involved with the higher paying dividend. That's exactly right. Um, so not that Tesla pays a dividend, but I'm just saying, but you're like, you had a software company. A software company that had a A software really company dividend. that was paying a 12% dividend. Intel is not paying a 12% no. dividend. So you can naturally assume that that company is further out on the risk spectrum than maybe one of the one of the blue chips. So you can't just chase yield, just chase income, and think that you're staying in the conservative side of the portfolio because that's not always the case. Yeah. When I threw out the Tesla thing, uh, Tesla was on the brain, uh -huh. I should have been thinking Tesla bonds are going to be higher that's than right. like a Coca-Cola bond, but the dividends bringing it back in context. There I don't want go. people to think... Tesla is Does it paying dividends? Own any Tesla? No, no, that's no. We want to make sure we keep that straight. Also, there's also an impact by inflation. I think when people chase yield, how often the, the, I hear this so often, Bo. Now I want you to kind of share what we found when we did research. Mm -hmm. People said, you know, they hear that bonds back in the early '80s were paying double digits. Yeah. You know, Treasuries were paying double digits, and they're like, I would have just bought a whole portfolio of that, and then sure. I'd have no risk. 
Why do we always have to share them to give them context? Yeah, the problem is that there is an equity risk premium associated. So you can assume that if interest rates or if rates on treasuries or safer investments like that, if yields are so high, the chances are two things are happening. One, equities are returning some number higher than that because of the premium that you pay. And two, inflation is probably rampant. We did a really easy example. Would you rather have a 10% rate of return or a 6% rate of return? Well, most folks would naturally say, oh, I would much rather have a 10% rate of return. That's a useless metric unless you understand how inflation affects that. You'd much rather have a 6% rate of return with 2% inflation than a 10% rate of return with 8% inflation. Your real rate of return, how much your dollars are growing in terms of purchasing pattern, pattern uh, purchasing power matters. I, I thought it was, because we, we had read in a research piece by a blog post by I can't remember David's last name, but I loved how he, oh, he mentioned yeah, yeah. that in 1980, an example of inflation was if somebody was going and getting a, a yield of 11% out of a treasury bond, that, that sounds great. But then you find out inflation was at 14%. You're losing personal You're actually power. losing money. That's so right. that just gives you perspective is when you think about rate of return, you got to make sure you understand the component of inflation too. And then I like to always talk about Tax efficiency. Of course you do. You're the CPA. Well, Why the, would you want to talk about tax efficiency? Well, one of the big things, when you design a portfolio and your rate of return, you need to think about, we talk about asset location. Mm -hmm. You want to put your bonds in the tax deferred accounts, like your retirement accounts. You want to put your growth assets into like your Roth IRA, so right. they can be tax-free growth. You got to be taking that stuff into account because that has a direct impact on your rate of return. Because there's two things that impact your rate of return is taxes and how much in fees you That's pay. Exactly so you've got to right. be paying attention to how tax efficient things are. Now, people, we talked about this. Another example we'd been reading recently was somebody talking about they, wanted, they had a portfolio that could yield 10%. Okay. Was it better if that yield was paid out as a 10% like, let's say, as interest like, rate? Like so, an income on that. So if you had, you know... a. 10, if you could have $1,000 invested making 10%, is it better to get that $100 as interest or is it better if it actually appreciated at 10%? So I think someone who has no context for what we're talking about, they say, oh, it's the same. Whether I get $100 in income or $100 in capital appreciation, it's, it's the exact same thing. It's a 10% rate of return. That's cute, but Uncle Sam doesn't look at it that way. Because <laughs> if you think about it, if you have to, when you file your taxes at the end of the year that you made 10%, you're first you're celebrating, like hot dog, I made 10%. Right. And we're going to keep the number simple at $1,000. So that $100 of income, guess what? It's taxable. That's exactly Uncle right. Uncle Sam's going to want your cut at ordinary income tax mm -hmm. rates on that 10%. Yep. If you bought something for $1,000, it appreciates 10%. At the end of the year, when it, you go to file taxes, like you bought an S&P 500 index fund, yep. assuming we'll take the dividends out of this analysis, we just want to talk about the appreciation of that 10%. That's right. When you file your taxes at the end of the year, you don't owe the government a dollar nope. of taxes on that 10% of appreciation. It is worth $100 more than it was at the beginning of the year. What I think is so interesting is you know how I know that we're on to something? This is a little bit of a teaser for a show that's coming out in the near future. If you read through Warren Buffett's most recent letter to shareholders, which we're gonna be covering in an upcoming show, one of the things that he talks about is there is some juice that exists at Berkshire Hathaway because he's able to have unrealized gains across his $173 billion investment portfolio. You guys as individual investors get that same benefit from not having to pay tax on that. So it's a very efficient way to grow your assets through time. So all these things we've just talked about, whether we're talking about total return versus the yield or income, when we're talking about tax location, all this is still nibbling around the edge of rate of return and how you should design your portfolio That's to right. maximize these things. The big part and the, an important part is how does this fit into your financial plan? Yep. What's the appropriate structure of for your financial plan? Because investment management is only one component. And that's when we talk about specific investments, we're talking about investment management. But we all know a financial plan is going to be so much more holistic. It's going to take into account what year you want to retire, what your cash flow needs. All these things will come into play in the design of your portfolio. Oh, I just hold on, I just got a private message. This is a great question. Uh, this just came through. It says, okay, but what if in your example, I wanted to spend the $100? Again, this is one of the benefits. If you're not out there listening live to us, you can actually communicate with us directly out there live. 
What if I wanted to spend the hundred dollars? So you talked about you had this unrealized gain. Well, you're not comparing apples to apples. If I had a hundred dollar dividend, yeah, I have to pay tax on it, but I can go spend that hundred dollars. But well, okay, let me nerd out because this is this gets me excited. My, <laughs> my CPA excitement just takes over is because I know what they're thinking. They're thinking, okay, if I needed to pull a hundred dollars out, yes, the interest income would be a, a taxable right. on a hundred dollars. So when I pulled a hundred out of this, if I sold a hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. It would, I would have to pay $100 of capital gains right. tax. And now I could first, there'll be one nerdy point is that capital gains rates could be lower than ordinary income tax rate. Yep. But here's the truth of the matter. And you probably didn't realize you're walking into this situation with the question that was just put out there. When you pay capital gains, do you, it's not like you, you front end loaded this, like you first in, first out, or you just did it on the gain and you pay tax on the gain. You pay tax on the proportion of the gain to the total holding. That's right. So it's, you still, it's going to be a percentage of the $10,100 because right. it's, it's $100 divided by 10100 and your gain is only going to be essentially a tenth of it. That's so right. So it's going to be a much lower tax rate, plus you go get the favorable capital gains yep. rate. Great question. I don't know who threw it out there, but it is one of those things where I think it's it shows makes our point that it makes a difference on how much you pay in taxes on how it's invested. Sorry, I didn't mean to throw you off. I, that, was just, that was just too good not, not to throw out there. You were then talking about how it's got to be part of an appropriate financial plan. It's got to be something that's wrapped into your investment and your rate of return isn't the end-all be-all. It's part of something bigger than itself. Well, it's, it's back to that example I gave earlier of what's a reasonable rate of return or what you should expect. If you were the 60-year-old still only doing all S&P 500, you're doing something wrong. Or if you're the 25-year-old that's all only in treasuries because you're scared of the market or you're sitting in cash because you tried to market time, you're doing it wrong too. Those things take into account the financial plan of what's your goal? How many years are you from retirement? What's your cash flow needs? All those things are going to help shape it. And that leads to one of the last things I want to talk about kind of with this before we talked about the the, the moving into the other things of how do you calculate it and so forth was... Risk tolerance versus risk capacity. Oh, we yeah. did that in the first example, which showing that poor 60-year-old that because they didn't understand how rate of return worked, they might have been way too aggressive. Yep. And, you, and it's not just your risk tolerance. There's a lot of cowboys out there. A lot of you guys started companies or you've done things where you don't mind risk. Risk has never stressed you out. But you're going to reach an age where you just don't have the time to recover from a bad mistake. Yep. That's risk capacity. So your rate of return is impacted not only by risk tolerance, meaning your ability to emotionally handle the volatility of the markets, but also risk capacity as you get older because you don't want to take make a, a jump on something that you just don't have the ability to recover from anymore. And, and one thing that we've been talking about lately, Brian, because we've had a lot of uh, potential clients who have reached out to us that fall into this category, we always talk about risk capacity in the context of, okay, well, what if the market turns down and I don't have enough time to recover from that? Risk capacity actually lives in another place that we don't talk about as much. What if you're someone who's won the game? Yeah. What if you're someone who already has a portfolio of assets built up that can provide the life that you want in retirement and do all the things you want to do? Do you need to go out there and get an 8 to 10% rate of return? Or will a very conservative 5 6 7% rate of return allow you to do all the things you want to do? Your situation has the capacity to take some risk off the table because you've won the game. I just, and, that one hit me. And, and, and it's good because it transitions nicely into the savings v- rate versus withdrawal rate. Right. It's because somebody who's in your savings when you're young, in your 20s and 30s and 40s, you need to be saving 15 to 25%. And that's going to be directly impacts into your growth portfolio and how that's structured. But when you retire, you transition from a savings rate to a withdrawal rate that's that right. might be like 4 to 5%. Yep. So all those things go into play on what's your rate of return and what you're required and needed to have a successful design of your portfolio. Yep. So let's, let's kind of transition to some analytics. Let's give them some nerdiness of talking about how do you calculate your rate of return? And um, I wanted to pull is up. It ba- on the is screen. it bad that I'm nervous about this one? Is that bad? Why? Because it's a mathematical. It's just because it's so mathematical, and uh, there's just a whole lot. There's a whole lot to it. And here, here's what we're going to try to do. We're going to try to break it down pretty simply. 
uh, into some simple metrics that are easy to kind of get your head wrapped around and grasp so that if you're someone, you're looking at your account statements or uh, you get reports from a vendor or custodian, you can do this on your own. Or if you have multiple account statements for multiple years, we want to equip you to be able to do it in a nice, simple fashion. Well, I didn't want to, and I didn't want to get too far into the weeds here because you could sure. go, you could go That's a what zillion I was nervous different about. directions. I know you could get into time weighted, you could get into dollar weighted, right. you could really. But the big things you need to understand is don't let simple math confuse you from at least understanding how most programs are doing things. The you know most people are using simple math. That's They're right. doing a simple average, yep. and, and I'll give you an example. I pulled this from Investopedia. I thought it was a great example. Is they used three numbers. They said, "What if you had three years? The first year you made fifteen percent. The second year you lost ten percent. Third year you made five percent. What's your rate of return?" The typical person is if I ask somebody off the street, how do you figure your rate of return? They're going to add all these three numbers up. Fifteen which, plus negative ten plus five. Equals 10. It's 10% divided by three. Three years. So it goes to 3.33%. 3. 3. And I, th I think another thing to mention, and we should have even back backtracked on this, how do you know if you made 15% in one year or 10% a loss in one year? That's really easy. It's just called a holding period return. What you want to do is you want to take your ending value minus your beginning value divided by your beginning value. Now, if there are cash flows, contributions in, or withdrawals out, you have to account for that. But essentially, to calculate the period for any one holding time, Ending, ending portfolio value minus beginning portfolio value divided by beginning portfolio value. It's good that you say that because I know we've had people, prospects, that have come in the door and will say, well, how much have you made with your current advisor? Right. And be like, I, I don't know. And I'll be like, well, how much, you know, how about talk to me about 2008. How much did you lose in right. 2008? Well, my advisor says we don't we didn't lose anything because we, we didn't, didn't sell, sell anything. anything. Oh. That is that is a line that I've heard a gazillion times. I'm like, well, that's kind of true in the fact that you haven't recognized you haven't recognized the gain or loss, but you, there's it's an unrealized there. <laughs> gain or loss. I mean, if you looked at your value on January 1st of 2008, and then you looked at it on December 31st of 2008, there was a rate of return calculation right. that should have been calculated. But we hear that all the time. Where you know that used to be you know because we haven't had a bad town turn like that yep. since then. But I always that's, that's very cute when the advisor goes, you haven't lost anything because you didn't sell it. Well. There's, you need to have a track record of how things are going. So um, it, I'm glad you threw that out there because yeah. that's very helpful. I want to talk about what, you know, when we looked at this Investopedia article, what is the better way? If we're not going to do the simple average, what's the better way? It's, it's more the geometric average, that's right. which takes into account what's actually happening by the time, you know, through with time, these, these assets. Yep. So it's a very simple thing. So we take the exact same numbers at 15%. The loss of 10%, and then the third year three, it was a gain of 5%. But here's the cool thing, and I always like this when you do the math on it. You're, you're going to put a one in front of it. So Because yep. if you made 15%, it'd actually be 1.15. You see what it did? One is 100%. You add the 15%, so that's why it's 1.15. Yep. You then multiply that. By you remember year two, mm -hmm. you lost ten percent. So you, you're now you're one, you're hundred percent, which is one lost ten percent. So yep. it's point nine. So you're multiplying one point one five times point nine. Yep. And then year three, we know you made five percent. So you're gonna multiply by one point oh five. That's right. And you'll just it's a quick math calculation. You multiply those all three of those together, and then you divide it by three. And the number comes up to be 1.0281. Yeah, you can you can divide by three. What's even better is if you actually raise it exponentially to the one divided by the number of periods. Look at you getting all nerdy. Well, no, I'm is just it because I've been out of college. No, longer? it's just the geometric. So the geometric rate of return calculation is actually here. Let me pull it up on the screen so Bo can show him that his equation's probably better. I think it's on there. Yeah, you you just passed it. Scroll down just a touch. Your eyes are yep. there. It there is. it is. Yep. So one point one five on there, isn't it? Times point nine. Look at you. Times one point oh five raised to the one divided by three. So you just take all of your holding period returns. It's add good to one. Keep me humble. I like that. Keep me <laughs> humble. You add one to it, and then you raise it to the one divided by your number of periods. If you're ever curious, so if somebody asks you, "Hey, how have you done since two thousand eight? Because we have people all the time come in and say. You know, 2008 was really bad, but I think the markets have been doing really good. If you can just go calculate what you did in 2009 and then 2010 and then 2011, you can actually geometrically link those returns together to figure out what your portfolio has been doing. Now, 
if you're a client of ours, you get to see that anyways on your quarterly reports. But if you don't have someone doing that for you, it's a really easy way that you can do it on your own. Um, I, I do have a confession because you can see when we did the simple math through simple average, it was 3.33. Mm-hmm. We did it the fancier way, the more accurate way, and it came out to be 2.81. That's right. I still sometimes use the simple average. Just well, because it's of, much easier to come so up with. It's so easy to figure out. Yeah. But it, here's, here's, the, here's the other cool thing. We, I want you to understand the math. This is kind of like when you take your calculus class. Your teacher wants you to, or you know, if you're using your calculator, if you can show you understand how things work, it's then okay if you use a crutch to figure right. out your actual return. Your crutch for most of our clients is after you understand how things are calculated, is you can have a financial advisor exactly that right. is actually using portfolio management software that is tracking this. And that's a great way for me to kind of close it out to understand all the different facets of rate of return. Because in this, remember we talked about, the first thing was, what is, you know, what, what should you expect from your rate of return? What's a reasonable expectation? You know, what's the factor of understanding the power of your rate of return? That's that That's 88 right. times over, the multiplication, the, the exponential compounding interest that you could get. And then what's the influences? Are we about to cross it? Look at that, guys. Yeah. Right at the closing <laughs> moment here. Oh, man, I got to get the hype button working. 20,000. Oh, 20,000 YouTube subscribers. We did that quickly. Wow. That Thank was... you so much. How did we, did we do that right there at the end of the show as you're doing the recap? It's almost like we staged that, but that worked out really, really well. But if you're someone listening out there on iTunes or out there in podcast world, and you're not part of the YouTube watching this stuff happen in real time, that you have really no idea well. why Brian stopped mid-sentence and we both just got quiet. It totally, that was awesome. it totally me- messed up my pitch. <laughs> <laughs> is what it did. Now look, somebody just unsubscribed to totally Josh with us a little bit. Oh, look at that. Still all counting. right, we're getting still engaged, counting. but here's the thing. You've come to the Money Guy Show. We've talked all about rate of return, really the power, all facets of it, of what you can do for it. it. You Probably the biggest thing is make sure that your rate of return reflects you yep. and what you need. I think that's the biggest thing. A lot of us get glossed over. We get excited. That whole thing of fear and greed, the greed where we go for too much too fast right. or stay aggressive for too long. And then the fear where is that person who maybe you're not taking enough risk for what you should to accomplish all your goals. It's nice if you have somebody in your corner that can help you measure twice, cut once, and do a good job with that. Exactly so if, you, right. if you're interested in taking the relationship to the next level, go check out moneyguy.com. You can go to aboundwealth.com and then go to the contact us page. And we have a way for you to reach out. And we love to always have those conversations to see if we can help set you up with the appropriate rate of return for all of your financial planning That's needs. It. Did I miss anything? No, I, I think I got you, kind of thrown off I think by the whole that, thing. You know, the big thing is if you're someone out there, just remember, investing and rates of return are one part of the plan. They're not the plan themselves. You have to have something that makes sense for you. Here's what I'm, I love. If you're Again, if you're out there listening to iTunes World, we're about to do some live Q&A after this. I'm so excited because I just know people are going to start sending us their rates of return and ask us to do on-the-fly calculations. <laughs> I hope not. We're probably not going to do that. in the other office. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you guys so much for joining in. This is awesome. Thank you for being part of a milestone episode where we crossed over 20,000. Uh, We are just so grateful for you. We love having you guys, and we're so excited we get to do this. Thanks, guys. We'll see you very shortly.